Grown is a podcast from the moth. Please like and subscribe to our channel and click the bell icon to get new video updates. When you're online to give in your ticket for the dance, you can already hear the music coming through the door of the school gym, which um, smells like Axe body spray, but with like a layer of Febreze over it because they tried to hide it for the dance. You're walking through the door of the gym after handing your ticket, and the DJ booth to the right is blasting music, but the acoustics are awful, and they're not reaching the other side of the gym. On one side, you have, like, the snacks table, and all of the sixth grade boys are there, like, shoving chips in their face and, like, in Minecraft t-shirts. And then you have the other side, which is the dance floor, and it's mostly girls, but some guys, too, and some guys and girls dancing. Well, the kids, some girls and boys dancing a little too close together, and the teacher's pulling them apart. And I had this huge crush on this guy. I thought he'd asked me to the dance, and I, like, see him across the way. So Peter's walking up to the prettiest girl in the grade with this big box in his hand, and he opens it up and real slow, like those Apple iPhone boxes, it slides open, and in it is this glass rose. And he, like, says something to her, and she starts, like, jumping up and down and giggling, and they hug, like, for a very long time. And I'm just watching as, like, the balloon streamers engulf my body. Uh, And I realized he did not ask me to the dance, or maybe he lied to me, but he had just asked this girl to be his girlfriend, uh, and I was crushed. Wait, what was this dance? It was, like, the spring fling dance of seventh grade. You had a dance in spring? Yeah, the spring fling. (laughs) It's in the name, Fonzo. Wow. Uh... We had, like, four dances a year. What? And I can remember what I wore to every single one of them. What's four times Why? three? Shit. What's four times three? Four dances. Twelve? It- Twelve. Thank you. Twelve dresses, and I remember every single one. So what you wear did you wear to spring fling? Uh, I wore this green dress that had, like, a little bow, and I remember I showed up, and I thought I looked really cute, and this girl was like, that's what you're wearing, and I wanted to, like, uh, crawl cringy. into a hole. This is even before I get crushed. Just, like, one crush after another crush in middle school. Every uh, Four times a you're year. You're just getting stomped <laughs> on, yeah, <laughs> left and right. Every dance. I, would Every stay, dance. I wouldn't have came to any of them. Grown. 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 I'm Fonzo. And I'm Aliza. And this is Grown, a podcast from the moth full of stories about what it means to grow up. On Grown, we're going to have real people telling real stories from their lives about those in-between moments where they're not really a teen, but they're definitely not fully grown yet. We're also going to be hitting the streets talking to you about what it means to grow up, and we'll be diving deep with teenagers who we all know are really going through it. And Fonzo and I, we're on this journey with you. We're going to be reflecting on how these stories make us think about our lives differently and all the ways that we are kind of not fully grown either. Yes, we're on this journey with you guys. We'll be exploring a lot of different things this season. Themes like secrets, culture, mental health, and a whole bunch more. But for our very first episode, we're doing Crushed. Stories about young love, expectations, and feeling like the whole world might just explode. First up is David Leppelstadt with a story that shows I wasn't the only one with complicated middle school dances. Here's David. So throughout my middle school career, I had many different crushes. It was about the time when I started to develop real feelings for my peers, but no one was allowed to hear about any of them. The first reason, rejection. I was scared that I would admit that I liked someone and it would get to them, and then they wouldn't like me back, and that just seemed like a scary position for me to be in. The second reason was acceptance. I was scared that I was going to admit I liked someone, that person finds out about it, and they may like me back, and then where do we go from there? I was like, oh, maybe then we'll have to date, and then, oh, what's this? We're broken up, and then all of my friends don't like hers, and all of her friends don't like mine, and it just seemed like a lot of drama at the time. (laughs) But then eighth grade came, and along with eighth grade came my biggest crush of all. It was on this girl named Rachel, who sat next to me um, in geography class, and 
It just seemed like there was this time in my life where I was only going to school just for that class and just to sit next, with, next to her and race her on the geography video game and see who could name more countries. Um, she was just amazing. Like, we had all these inside jokes with each other, and I just had this feeling that I couldn't hold on to this crush any longer. And lucky for me, our middle school prom was right around the corner. That's right, I went to a small progressive middle school, and we had a prom for the eighth graders. Um, so I was like, that's a great entrance into this romantic scene in my middle school. I'll ask Rachel out to prom. Um, so I went home and I looked up on Google how to ask someone out to prom. Um, and I come across these things called promposals, which are these sort of like proposals for marriage, but this time for the prom. Um, and a lot of them had this musical element, like a, uh, you know, someone sings a song or does a dance. So I'm thinking, hey, you know, I'm kind of musical. I can do that. Um, next thing I know, I'm waiting for Rachel outside of class, ukulele in hand. Um, and I sing her a song asking her to prom. And it's a little bit overkill. People are like, you could have just got flowers, but she's laughing and, and she seems to really like it and perhaps think it was cute. And she says yes. And I'm like, wow, this is so cool. Um, <laughs> So next thing you know, we're at prom, and it's this under-the-sea under theme. Uh, there's inflatable lobsters on the floor. Uh, every table has a seaweed centerpiece. And Rachel and I have this wonderful night. Like, we're just talking the whole night, and we never leave each other's side. And we even have our caricature drawn together by the caricature artist, which feels like a really big move for me. Um, and it's just this magical, nautical night. And at the end of it, we hug, and we say goodnight, and I walk away, and I'm like, well, that wasn't so bad. That wasn't so scary. This is really cool. Um, the next day, a bunch of us middle school prom couples are hanging out at Emma's house. <laughs> Emma was sort of like the ringleader of my middle school friend group. Um, and we're all hanging out watching the movie Frozen, um, <laughs> as you do. And, and then there's one point where Rachel gets up and excuses herself to use the bathroom. Um, and at that moment, all the attention in the room turns to me. And Emma stands up and she says, David, have you had your first kiss yet? And I say, no. And she says, oh, well, Rachel hasn't has her, had her first kiss yet. And um, she leaves for camp tomorrow for the rest of the summer. Uh, and she said that she would like her first kiss to be with you. Wow. I mean, <laughs> I... I'm not even thinking about a kiss. This is crazy to me. And then Rachel just comes back in the room and everyone goes back to normal and I'm just really in my head. Like this is, I mean, I'm thinking, wait, I do want to have my first kiss with Rachel, but this is so soon and an ultimatum on top of it. Um, but then as we're watching the movie, people are sort of motioning like, David, maybe you should, you know, put your arm around her, make a first move on the way to your kiss later today. Um, and I'm sort of like still and stagnant. But then the song Let It Go come on, comes on, and you know what I do? I let that arm go. And I put it around Rachel, and she smiles and sort of snuggles up next to me, and it seems like a good move. And I'm like, okay, maybe I can do this kiss. But then the movie ends, and Rachel abruptly is like, okay, I have to go home. Um, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna miss my opportunity. But then I'm like, okay, I'll walk you to the train. And I go and follow her to the door, and everyone's just like, yes, go. Um, so Rachel and I are walking to the train, and this is uh, me agreeing to kiss her, I feel, in my head. Um, and everyone at the Hangout agrees as well, because my phone is ringing off the, it's going crazy. People are texting me, make sure you put your hands on your hips when you kiss her. Make sure you lean down, because you're much taller than her. And make sure you pick a side, pick a side to lean on. So I'm just like, okay, bend down, you're taller. Hands on hips, pick a side, pick a side. And, and just like that, all of the like lovely banter that Rachel and I had before is kind of gone. She's just kind of like walking and, and I'm just in my head and, and not really saying a word. And we get to the train station. Uh, we walk down to the subway platform um, and I'm just too nervous. And she's waiting there for me to do something and I, I, I can't. And I just say bye. And, and, and she says bye and she swipes her Metro card and the turnstile divides us. And I'm, I'm thinking like, oh, why'd you let all those texts get in your head? Like, this is actually something you want to do. And then I look, and I see the train times, and I see I still have one more minute. 
and something gets a hold of me. So I take out my Metro card. And I go for a swipe, because love is worth wasting a Metro card swipe. And I go, and I meet her on the platform, and, and she just starts laughing hysterically. And I ask her, why are you laughing? And she just says, oh, I laugh a lot when I get nervous. And that makes me feel so much better, because I'm really nervous as well. And I ask her if she wants to have her first kiss with me. And she says, yes. And so I put my hands on her hips. I lean down because I'm a lot taller than her. I pick a side, I pick the right side. And as the train is coming, we place a little peck on the side of our lips. And the wind from the train hits us. And it's magical. And I, I, I'm, I'm really celebrating this moment, but I don't celebrate it with her. After it happens, I run away because there's no like staring off longingly into our eyes, none of that. No, I just leave the train station and I walk out from the subway platform and I'm just thinking about all the moments I can have in my life that are so exciting if I just put myself out there. I went from someone who couldn't even admit he had a crush on someone to asking a girl out to prom with my ukulele, having my first kiss, and more important than that, establishing a really special connection with someone I like. And there were so many thoughts running through my head, but one of them just kept sticking with me. It was just this amazing thought. I just kept thinking, I did it. Thank you. That was David Leppelstadt. We'll be asking every storyteller that appears on Grown how the younger self would describe them now. David said that he's not as good at guitar or basketball as he would have hoped, but he's a nice enough guy. That's really sweet. Also, if you're wondering what happened to David and his crush, well, we asked him. He said that he's still in touch with Rachel and recently went with his current girlfriend to meet with his old middle school friends, and Rachel was there, and they really got along. And if you want to see a picture of David at his under-the-sea prom, which I know you want to see, we'll have that slightly awkward picture over at themoth.org slash grown. We'll also have a bunch of other cool stuff and ways to get in touch with us and our social medias and all that jazz. Up next, a story about parental expectations. But first, Fonzo, I've just got to say something about crushes. I really love them. Like... It was like the only thing that got me to go to school. That is an interesting way of looking at it. You loved having crushes. I loved having crushes. You must have always gotten your crush then, I guess. You were never crushed. I was always crushed because I always, like, they would change weekly. They would change weekly? Like, that was like the running. I mean, I'm talking about when I was, you know, in second and third grade, not like last week. That would be weird. No, (laughs) I know. I'm weird. Matter of, I think we're all talking about in the past Yeah, tense. like the kitty crushes. You know, I mean, yes, we have crushes now. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to Zendaya. But um, Miss Crushes, I love having crushes. <laughs> Are these like kitty crushes or like how about like older crushes, like high school crushes? Did you enjoy mm. those as much? No, not even close. Because, you know, when you're a kid, it's so innocent. But as you get older— it's embarrassing to like someone, and you're so awkward, and it's like, do they know? Do they not know? Oh, um, yeah. I definitely had a lot of crushes in high school. None none of them reciprocated. Have you ever been ghosted? Because that, I don't know. I could talk about that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, I mean, that's the thing about being crushed. Like you, know? you wanted to be the chase, not the chaser. Yeah, yeah. So you, you know wanted me. to be the I crusher, was doing not the, the ghosting. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I was Casper, the friendly ghost. Are you I'm proud saying. of yourself for that? I'm not proud. I wouldn't be proud. It is what it is. It was what it was. Yeah. No, but it's so normalized, I guess. You, tell me, you've been ghosted before? I was ghosted by this guy that I really, really liked, and I thought it was going great, and he ghosted me. And I spent that entire summer, like, staring at my last message to him, hoping to see the three bubbles pop up. You know, like someone's texting back. <laughs> the bubbles. <laughs> the bubbles. Like, oh, my God, the, the hurt and the anxiety that that caused me. And then I went to college, and it was like, life goes on, and I stopped, like, waiting for the bubbles. No, to this day, I still—no, just kidding. But um, Dang. also, when I, was, when I was a kid, I couldn't—even though my parents met in high school, I wasn't allowed to date. I had to hide it if I yeah. like, liked a boy, if I kissed a boy. Like, I wouldn't tell my mom, you know? Yeah. Um, Speaking of dates— do you remember your first dinner date? <laughs> Not your first dinner date, but your first dinner date in the Lower East Side? 
<laughs> yeah, I do remember Fonzo. I'm just playing. No, no, let's talk about it. <laughs> In 2017, uh, 2017, me and Elisa went on a date. date before. Me and Elisa went on a date before. <laughs> we did, we did. We went on one date. I think we were better off podcast hosts. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was like it was it was uh it was a you genuine it, it was a genuine date. Like, it was I nice. Mean, it, like, was it was cute. Like, it was like, like uh I was like you know this is yeah let's do it. it was like I I felt like it was like my first experience on an actual date and so like that was my I first was, date too. Yeah, I was like uh you know. So yeah. I needed that ex- experience. Yeah. yeah, I never thought I never felt some type of way about it. I was like, because no, also was, we knew each a, other was, for so was, long. Yeah, like yeah, we'd yeah, known yeah. each other. Like before then, we knew each other for like two years. Mm-hmm. So it was just like, uh, I was like, oh, I might as well. Like, try, like I don't know. Yeah, I believe in platonic friendship between two. No, I mean, when I asked you, I was asking you on a date. No, no, I know. I oh no, I know that. <laughs> I wasn't like my friend Fonzo's taking me to dinner. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, it was a great. I like, I think it was a it was a great dinner regardless. It was. I had a great yeah. time, and like that's we the ghosted thing. each other though. We ghosted Speaking each other. Speaking of ghosted, we ghosted each other. We ghosted other. each other. Yeah. Uh yeah. You asked me to see the Spider Man movie, and I said no, and then you're like, "All right." <laughs> <laughs> I remember. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Um, like when you felt weird about crushes growing up, did you have that like one person that you always went to to talk about it? No, I didn't really have that. I didn't have that. Mm-hmm. Did you? My mom. So you did tell your mom about, but I didn't tell her everything. So yeah, yeah. I guess did you like know. stop at a certain point? Yeah, probably when I like when I got older. <laughs> How older? I don't know, like, mm, I don't know, like 16. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Does your mom ask currently about, you, like, what's going on in a certain situation? Well, I mean, like, I have a boyfriend now, so I'll talk to her about him sometimes, but I don't really have a lot to Does complain about Does she talk to about you about him. your dad? Too much, man. <laughs> it's like, I'm not your freaking love therapist, you know? Um, that's so awesome. No, I mean, like, look, I think that's a good place for us to go to. Like, we're both in relationships now, you know? We went from going on a date with each other. It takes a while to get here, you know? <laughs> to now be You gotta go on those dates. <laughs> those... So I, that's how we got here, you know? Yeah, that's so true. Being crushed leads you to where you're supposed yeah, to be. Exactly. Now, here's Sasha M., who might even be worse at crushes than you, Elisa. <laughs> when I was 18, I was in a special pre-med program that would allow me to skip two years of college and enter medical school immediately. I didn't particularly want to be in this program, but my mother had drummed it into my head that I had just two choices in life. I could become a doctor or a bum. (laughs) So about two weeks after college started, I'm in my dorm and there's a knock on my door. Mom, what are you doing here? Why did you drive three hours up here without telling me? She tells me, you lie to me. You had sex. I read it in your diary. You are a bad girl. I'm thinking, I'm bad? I mean, most people would think that it was a gross violation of privacy for her to dig into my diary, right? But I don't say anything because my mother had also drummed it into my head that we were not like most people. She would remind me constantly that we are immigrants. We are not always welcome. We need to work twice as hard in order to be accepted. And maybe it's because we are from Korea, or maybe it's because we live in New York City where real estate is unaffordable, or maybe it's because my mother is a doctor, she's actually a gynecologist, and she's used to looking at lady parts all day long, so she has no concept of privacy. (laughs) Or... Or maybe it's because my dad was away And she didn't want to sleep alone, but from the time that I was a baby until I was 11 years old, not only did I share a room with my mother, I slept on the same bed with her. My brother, being male, always got the second bedroom. Yeah, so I have some mommy issues, okay? (laughs) So for most of my life, I kind of lead a double life, and I keep some secrets from my mother. Like how I was in high school, when I was in high school, one of my best friends, Lisa, was a raging kleptomaniac. She'd come to school, she'd point to her entire outfit from head to toe and say, all this lifted. (laughs) One day, we go to a chocolate shop with a guy named David who I have a mad crush on. 
were there, and I want to show David that I'm just as bold as Lisa. So when the security guard's not looking, I slip a gold foil piece of chocolate down my sleeve. As we're walking out of the store, my head is filled with visions of the school newspaper publishing an article saying, "Model minority exposed." Yearbook editor fired for stealing $8 bar of Danish chocolate. <laughs> luckily, I do not get caught, and luckily, this is not in my diary. But other stories about David are in my diary, and my mom is ranting and and asking who this David is. David was on the tennis team. I'd see him in class sometimes right after practice, his forehead glistening with sweat, and I would dream about. Wiping that sweat off his forehead. <laughs> I'd also dream about doing things with him, you know, things that I had read about in Cosmopolitan magazines with titles like "67 Moves to Blow His Mind." <laughs> The truth is, David and I never even kissed. No, he liked Lisa. Of course he did. She was tall, she was beautiful, and she was cool. So, you know, I was writing a lot. I was writing in my diary because at some point I realized that when I wrote about things, it helped me manage my disappointments. So when I saw David flirt with Lisa, my diary became less of a diary and started venturing into cheap erotic fiction. <laughs> I started experimenting with sentences like. He pulled me in close for a long, moist kiss. I unzipped his little white tennis shorts and out popped his bulging manhood. <laughs> so, what my mother read in my diary was alternative fact. <laughs> It was alternative fact created by a frustrated, pimply-faced. Jealous teenager, but I don't say all this to my mom because it's just too complicated. And she's ranting and raving. She asks, she says things like, "Do you know how many teenage girls I see every day who get pregnant? Some of them don't even know who the father is. Do not have sex. Focus on your studies. You will get AIDS." And I'm like, "Whoa, whoa, <laughs> mom, you're a doctor. You shouldn't be saying these kinds of ridiculous things, really." Goodbye. Don't have sex, she says. After this, she makes it a habit of calling me every single weekend and saying, "Don't have sex. Don't have sex." <laughs> Sometimes she says this at the end of our conversation in lieu of saying goodbye. <laughs> I don't tell her about Richard. Who's from Providence, Rhode Island? He plays the bass guitar. He's got—he's wearing one pink Converse shoe on one foot, an orange one on the right, <laughs> and he seems older, even though he's 18. He's got a beard, <laughs> and he likes me. Unlike David, he pursues me, and he picks me up after two months of dating. He picks me up in the middle of a crowded square, and shouts in front of everyone. I love this girl. <laughs> He also tells me one night, "Babe, you need to follow your passions. You got to be honest with your mother." So that Thanksgiving, I go home and I tell my mother, "I'm dropping out of the pre-med program because I want to study English." She tells me, "This is the biggest mistake of my life. We did not come to this country just so that you could be nothing." No one in my family is a writer. No one is an artist. I've never even seen my mother read a novel. She only has medical journals filled with pictures of venereal diseases. <laughs> but, you know, pursuing the arts was uncharted territory. But I knew I had to do it. I don't know if it was the best decision for me, but it was the only decision that I could make at the time. Many years have passed now, and if you're wondering what my relationship with my mother is like, now that I'm officially old, I've been married, I'm divorced, no children, our conversations go like this: It's not too late. You can still have a baby. I know so many single women who do it. 
I will give you treatments. We can go to a sperm bank together. We can pay someone on OkCupid. As absurd as all this is, I'm grateful when she says all these things because these are not the rantings of an old world, second class Korean immigrant. These are the ideas of a forward thinking, freedom loving, true blooded American. That was Sasha M. When asked how her younger self would describe her now, she said, Wow, you turned out all right, but finish that book. Then I'd think you're really cool. Same, Sasha. Same. No one crushes in the exact same way. So we decided to hear from storytellers with the Moths Education Program about how they felt when they crushed hard. Here they are. I've never done anything absolutely wild because of a crush. I, I, I just very afraid of putting myself out there, I guess. Yeah. I realized that I was, um, or that I am trans, not binary. Um, (laughs) um, And I guess, like, it wasn't, in retrospect, it wasn't a crush. It was just, like, a huge, massive uh, gender envy. Uh, (laughs) um, But I appreciate that experience because it made me realize who I really am. I was in the library sitting opposite my crush, and she mentioned offhand that she liked the LaCroix seltzers, um, which I had never had at that point. But I all of a sudden was like, oh yeah, I love LaCroix seltzers. I drink them all the time. To which I went on my computer and placed an order for a 30 pack of these seltzers. And the next time at the library, I met her with a coconut flavored LaCroix seltzer. Um, and she was like, oh, okay, thank you, that's cool. So I was crushing pretty bad on this girl in high school, and I found out that she loves anime and Japanese culture in general. So I really sat down and tried to learn the entire Japanese language so I can speak it to her, and I thought like somehow that would win her over. Never learned it because it's incredibly difficult, but I probably will one day, but just because it's something that I want to learn how to do for myself. So, Eliza, now that we're all done with crushes... Well, I'm never really done with crushes. Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> What's our next episode about? Our next episode is all about getting lost and how to find yourself afterwards. Here's a little preview. So at this point, I was like, okay, this has to be some bullshit because how am I not even normal within this category of not being normal? <laughs> and <laughs> I carried that thought and a whole bundle of shame with me everywhere I went. Wow, I am so excited. To keep up to date on all our episodes, subscribe to Grown wherever you get your podcasts. We're also on social, Instagram, TikTok, all that stuff. Our handle is at GrownPod. And remember, no matter how old you are, you're never fully grown. Aliza Cosme is a multimedia storyteller passionate about using the power of storytelling for the social good. If she wasn't hosting this podcast and had no student loan debt, she'd own the best restaurant in Queens with the best risotto you've ever had. Alfonso Lacayo is a Moth alumni from the Bronx, New York. He's passionate, creative, and makes music. And if he's not hosting this podcast, you can find him putting essential oils in his hair. Grown's senior editor is Sarah Jane Johnson, and Grown's senior producer is Mark Solinger. That's me. With support from the Moss education and artistic teams, as well as our executive producer, Sarah Austin Janess, who also directed Sasha M's story. This podcast wouldn't be possible without the work of the Moss education team, Melissa Brown, Anna Stern, and Devin Elise Wilson, as well as our instructors, past and present. Mixing is by Davey Sumner, with original music and sound design by Davey Sumner and Luke Williams. We're grateful to former producer Julia Purcell, intern K.A. Carter, our teen focus group, and everyone who was kind enough to send us audio for our montages. The rest of the Moss leadership team includes Sarah Haberman, Catherine Burns, Jennifer Hickson, Meg Bowles, Kate Tellers, Jennifer Birmingham, Marina Cluche, Suzanne Rust, Brandon Grant, Leanne Gully, Inga Gladowski, and Aldi Kaza. All Moss stories are true, as remembered and affirmed by the storytellers. Grown is presented by PRX.